Welcome to the virtual lunch. Today is Friday, September 2nd, and this is virtual lunch number 632. Our guest today is Evangelos Apostolou, the general counsel of Syrian Labs, and this is part of our series on smarter contracting with Syrian Labs. Hi, Evangelos. How are you? Hey, I'm really well. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So I'm, I'm super excited for this, Evangelos. So tell us about your background and your new role at Syrian Labs. Uh, I was originally called the bar here in the UK, which is a way of describing trial attorneys as a barrister. Uh, I practiced for a small handful of years here in the UK, and then I went to Cyprus, which is in fact where I'm from in terms of my Greek background. And I spent a few years there uh, practicing law largely in the corporate space, in uh, Cyprus itself, of course, the Middle East, North Africa, the Balkans. And then when I realized that I was a little bit less Greek and a little bit more English, I went back to the UK and joined Fujitsu, where I was the EMEA council for some years. And from there, I went to BT, BT Global Services, where I grew up, I think, as an outsourcing uh, lawyer. Those were the days when a billion, a billion dollars was a small contract, and we thought that the contracts would outlive the pyramids. And of course, they were all renegotiated the second quarter after signature. And then from there, I joined the Ernst & Young, and I was the Asia-Pacific General Counsel for Ernst & Young for a, a handful of small years, previously having been the Asia-Pacific uh, Chief Counsel, Vice President for BT, uh, and then from there, I joined, the, in fact, Syrian Labs uh, for around about two years as the head of uh, EMEA, as the president for EMEA. That in itself is a very interesting uh, inflection point in my career because that's when I actually became responsible for a PL, having thrown rocks at people who had sold and had been responsible for businesses for many years. I was the one making the decisions uh, day to day and they weren't easy actually <laughs> so i spent two happy years there and then i joined uh, an executive search firm uh, which i think may be known to many of the people on the call called major Lindsay in africa uh, and i spent the past four years happily in major Lindsay africa and i've returned as the general counsel uh, to syrian labs and uh, i guess one more comment to make or two more comments to make one is that i began yesterday formally as the GC for the company. Uh, and we have, as a family, lived and worked in the US, in India, where my daughter was born, where I had the pleasure of first meeting Anupam and the team, in Hong Kong, and also in Singapore, where uh, my son was born. So we've, we've lived a nomadic life uh, until this point. I've been connected to Syrian Labs for some years. So I, the, uh, the backstory, is that when I established the captive for BT Group PLC in India, which was one of the first offshore initiatives uh, of a large FTSE uh, company out of the UK, it was bought out, if, those, if that's the right term, it was taken on by United Lex, one of the first uh, leading LPOs. And the co-founder of United Lex, uh, Ajay Agraval, is the founder and CEO of Syrian Labs. So I've, I've been connected to Syrian Labs in that sense for the better part of two decades. And so when I joined the uh, Syrian as President Amir, it was on the basis that I had known and been extremely interested in AJ's work for many years until that point. And then when I transitioned out of the Amir role, I stayed on as an advisory board member and to finally, to answer your question, Larry, it was the exposure to the issues in the market, the customer expectations and the way in which SaaS was at that point still building uh, in terms of its resonance amongst the legal and procurement and supply and commercial communities. And that's still happening, I think, to an extent. But that was the early points. And so the advisory board perspective has been 
extraordinarily helpful in understanding where the Syrian labs is positioned as much as the CLM and post-award contract signature space, which is really what distinguishes uh, Syrian from other CLM platforms. There are some departments, there are some functions that have surged ahead, but they are visible for having done so, uh, actually. Um, Microsoft, an organization that has leveraged a lot of the digital narrative in its favor, and is currently doing some very significant things, actually, in that space. DXC, Bill Deckelman. I'm sure you know about Bill Deckelman and his, the, the, the voice that he's built over two decades, really and how he talks about the digitization of the legal experience and how it relates, in fact, to change management. That is the core insight that he shares with us, actually, and how it is that we need to have a commitment of the people that work within a technology-enabled environment to make sense by way of significant progress. Uh, but uh, are the same problems there? Yeah, the same problems that they're distinguishing between what a legal and a commercial issue is and how that translates into dealing with people who, on the one hand, are seeking your advice, but also seeking your life and your blood on a daily basis. <laughs> Understanding how it is uh, that you can relate to requests for advice and assistance, which are couched in terms of outright violence on a daily basis, but still be useful and helpful to the people that are trying to rely on you. Uh, finding the contrary, I mean, let's, uh, let, me, let me, because I could, I could speak for a long time, unprompted, if you let me, Ari. So let me just concentrate on one aspect of being an in-house lawyer, and we'll go to, non in the taxonomy, non-contentious commercial contracts, right? Finding the contract in the first place, so that you're able to actually advise on it, is ordinarily at least half of the labor involved. So if, if we have even a junior in-house lawyer who on, uh, on getting the question really can't indicate what the business plan is uh, for the quarter or for the year or for the next three years or five years and cannot speak easily to where it is that revenue is being defended and where it is being grown and doesn't have a feeling at least for where it is uh, in terms of geography or segment or segments of uh, functional uh, business activity, there is a focus and doesn't actually understand where the litigation and regulatory and other risks lie, then we have an issue. We have an issue about what it means to be an in-house lawyer and how that in-house lawyer can relate to the, to the outcomes which the business needs. And the technology that we have uh, available to us really can enable that journey, that level of maturity that means that you have an idealized in-house lawyer interacting with a business in a way that allows the business to move quickly and to take advantage in an accelerated way of what the environment means for them. The step beyond being able to control and put into one place your data. So you have an estate of say 40, 50,000 contracts and then you're able to investigate those contracts, interrogate those contracts, and create views and perspectives that wouldn't otherwise have been available before. Right? So one, one, one very obvious way of leveraging that possibility is that when a regulator comes knocking, you can show them what you actually have, literally with a touch of a button. If the information has been ingested and uploaded in the structure in the right way, it's there. What would otherwise have, have made an army of people busy for weeks uh, in order to draw together imperfect information, in fact. I mean, that, 20 years ago, that was really the bear trap that people were looking to avoid, that you would give over information that you had 50 paralegals working over two weekends to create, knowing that you were likely not to have the right work product at the end. And then going forward, how wonderful is it, in fact, to be able to say, actually, on the basis of this contract information, these are the sort of price curves that we're experiencing in EMEA. This is where we are seeing regulatory restraints and constraints in South America. This is how Southeast Asia is behaving in terms of its customer adoption and uptake and so on and so forth. Galos Apostolo, everybody.
What a hey. wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for Great. being part of today's Super. virtual lunch. And thanks, of course, to Surion Labs for supporting this series on smarter contracting. Have a great weekend, everyone.